finally gave the Ringers Philly Crew a podcast. I'm Ben Solak. And I'm Shiel Kapadia. That's right. Just a couple of Philly guys with a new space to fire off some Eagles takes, get caught up in the Sixers chaos and more. We'll be coming to you twice a week on Sundays and Thursdays, plus bonus episodes whenever we get breaking news or Philly drama. Join the fun and follow the Ringers Philly special now on Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? Even though creators make the internet valuable, how much value do they get for their work? Well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also, more say, more control, more ownership. Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. Thank you for listening to the Ringers NBA Draft Show. It's our debut episode of our new weekly podcast, publishing every Wednesday from now through the draft to break down the 2023 NBA Draft class. My name is Kevin O'Connor, and every week I'll be joined by my friend and colleague, J. Kyle Mann. Kyle, what's going on, man? <laughs> it's, it's exciting. Um, I'm glad that we're getting to do this this early in the year that, you know, something that we think and talk. Of, this is a year round dialogue. So uh, we get in on it. And I think this is going to be a fun time to kind of and this is a special draft too. something I think we'll talk more about. So there's a lot to dig into um, a lot of different, you know, storylines to follow player development to things that could swing this way or that way that could affect how it all shakes out. We're going to cover all that stuff and talk about it. It's going to be a blast. I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be great. So we're going to be doing this. Like you said, we're starting early. It's November 9th. We're recording our first episode here. College basketball just started. The Overtime Elite League has started a couple weeks ago. Wemben Yama is playing internationally. G League Ignite just started up last week. And we'll be going every single week, every Wednesday, from now through the draft on June 22nd and into Summer League in July. So, I mean, we're going to get into what, Kyle? Risers and fallers, best fits, for NBA teams, because we're doing this podcast through an NBA lens. It's about prospects that you should watch as an NBA fan. And so this is a pod for really everybody. I mean, whether your team's drafting late in the first round or potentially has a chance at a top pick for some of the guys we'll be talking about a lot. And I think, Kyle, one of the things I'm looking forward to as well is we're going to do some redrafts, look oh, at yeah. recent draft classes, get into what we got right what we got wrong, <laughs> Killian Hayes, and a bunch of other stuff too. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm looking forward to all of that, man. And I think we're going to be learning about this draft class together because it's still early now. Evaluations are going to change a bunch. So what are you excited about? What are you lo most looking forward to with a weekly draft pod, Kyle? 
I don't know. I mean, I think it's fun. I think what what people are really going to get to see here is they're going to get to see the evolution of our thought processes and like why what goes into it. And we can have a dialogue with that about that with with people who casually follow the NBA or if you're a hardcore fan. And that part of it, I think, is really interesting to me is just process. You know, I feel like every year that I do this, I have my like set way that I go through and pick, you know, pick apart a player or, or just. I like this. I don't like that. Or think about the mistakes I made in the past and try to learn from them. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. something yearly that I do. And I think something else. Stay away from French prospects unless they're seven foot four. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that, that's my lesson that I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're a really good sport about it. About, I like, I, I, that's the only way. It's kind of the Tyrion Lannister, like just uh, use it as armor because you know, don't forget because no one else will. Kind of a thing. That's <laughs> what I'm noticing. <laughs> you. Well, I, I, mean, I listen, appreciate every, your jovial everybody's attitude. Made mistakes. Everybody has had home run picks. I mean, it's just the truth. Every draft evaluator in the league and, you know, us armchair, you know, general managers, you know, since we were kids watching the draft. This has been something I've been doing for a long time since I was a teenager. I mean, you too, Kyle. Like, we've always loved the draft. Maybe not to like talking about process. I mean, I think process was something that when I got it, I always casually followed sure. all levels of basketball. And I, I loved watching because since I'm, I live in college basketball country, it was always interesting to just... You're a Kentucky guy for the listeners who may not know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, I feel like I, it's out there pretty much now. People know that. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I always enjoyed monitoring that and like just talking about like who's which guys were going to translate and I would develop really strong. And what always amused me was I had the most like incendiary strong beliefs when I knew the least, like comparing, like comparing myself to like how much (laughs) info I have now compared to back then. I just, my conviction about my takes was, always I was just like, Oh yeah. Like Marvin Bagley's for sure. The best player. (laughs) And you just, you kind of learn what you don't know as you go. Something else I think that you said that's interesting though, is that like, this is going to be for every, um, it's a pod for every walk of life in the NBA because, um, and, and I don't think that, that, that that's something that we should downplay because we've seen over and over again, um, later in the draft, talk about process, talk about getting things wrong. We do this on a yearly basis. We get things wrong about players. And I, I think that that's a fun, I don't know, like Desmond Bain comes to mind. I mean, Number he's 30. leaping. Yeah, he's leaping into stardom and he was taken. So I don't think that we should downplay that as as an afterthought. Like there are real players to be had in every part of the draft. If you're Maxie smart about going twenty one, right? Got guys like that, or even like a like a Nick Claxton. Like he's not a star player, but he's a contributor. He's one of the most switchable defenders in basketball, and he goes thirty one. Keldon Johnson looking like a potential star this year. Yeah, for the Spurs, he goes twenty nine. So, I mean, every year there's guys like that. And, I mean, that that's what I'm really looking forward to you with you, Kyle, because we're going to cover everything in the draft. Today, what we're going to do is more of a an introduction to the 23 draft class. So, we're going to talk about the big names in the lottery. Some you might know, some you don't. Victor Wambanyama out of France, Scoot Henderson out of the G League, the Thompson Twins, Ahmed and Asar from the Overtime Elite. And then we're going to build a five-man lineup with our guys from college basketball this season, the players you need to know. Because I feel like, you know, there's been so much focus on OTE, so much focus on international and G League. College has been a bit overlooked. But we're going to start off with the number one prospect in the draft, Kyle, Victor Wembanyama. You ready to go? Let's do it. Let's just dive right into it. All right, let's let's start off with Victor Wembanyama, who listeners probably know already, but in case you don't, the Spark Notes version is this. He's an 18-year-old French center, Seven foot four with an eight foot wingspan. He can block jumpers basically with his elbows. Yeah. <laughs> he's <laughs> agile. He's intelligent. He's tough. On offense, he plays like somebody who's been watching KD videos since they were in diapers. He can hit threes off of movement. And he can handle the ball and cross over. He's a willing passer, even though that's not, it's not his top skill on offense. He's fearless. He's clutch. And he can also do like the big man stuff. He can screen, he can roll, he can finish over the defense. The only concern with him really is with his height and the history of big man having injuries. He's got his own injury history. That's concerning. But overall, he's the best prospect I've seen since I was 11 years old and first heard of LeBron James. And scouts that I've talked to who are much older than me say he's the best scout, they've, the best prospect they've ever seen. There's no doubt he's going first. Since we were in Nevada, Kyle, we saw yeah. him face the Ignite. 
in early October. He really put himself on the map, became a, a worldwide known star basketball player. All of my taxi drivers in Vegas knew about him. So for our <laughs> weekly Wemby update, tell me something new about Wemby Yama. I think the thing that you you talked about just now is really is really critical, or something that that makes when you, when you start to talk about, I, I sound like Fred Armisen in that SNL skit now, and like starting fragments of sentences. But I, I was going to say, when you talk about generationally special prospects, I think what you really are talking about is overlaps, and like you mentioned, LeBron as you know, when they start stacking things on them and you have like a hundred circles on the Venn diagram and like this player checks all these boxes and like they just go really far into like the filters that like differentiate players from each other. Like LeBron was crazy big, had an insane feel for the game, could handle the ball, um, was just a chess master out there at a really young age, could get to the rim really efficiently, all these things. And you talk about Win Banyama, you're talking about a guy that, um, like you said, is has crazy size. I think one of the questions you have to ask, though, is like, what is it that differentiates him from other players his size? What What is it that makes him different from a player like Bol Bol or a player like, I don't know, a big guy that Poku. has a lot of... Or <laughs> Poku, yeah, he dwarfs those guys. It's funny, you can see him <laughs> in a picture next to Rudy. Like, he dwarfs Rudy. He's like, you know, legitimately huge, huge hands. Um, I think that his feel... His touch, I think, is really, really uncommon for a player his size. I was watching a clip the other day. Uh, I'm working on something currently on Vic. There was a clip where a ball came to him and he quickly did a touch pass to a player under the rim with one hand before the ball. He never even caught the ball. He just tipped it to them uh, intuitively, smartly. Um, he just does things that guys his size don't do. And then I think you start talking about the dribble shooting, which I think we're going to get into a little bit. Um, he showed some of that in Vegas. Um, honestly, dude, like when we were in Vegas, I've been kind of like zooming out and thinking about this, t- trying to like, uh, get perspective on it. Think about what, what was that event? How special was it? I feel like that was like a, a bas- like a religious basketball experience. Everybody that came <laughs> away from that game was like, was like Rick Moranis and Ghostbusters. Like just, you know what I mean? Like he's walking out. He's just like, what the hell did I just see? I mean, I feel like that was a really special event, right? It, it felt like, I mean, for me personally, I think for you as well, Kyle, I don't want to speak for you, but it was like verification of everything that you saw in video. It was verification of everything you heard about this guy, seeing it with your own two eyeballs right there in front of you. Like, oh my God, like this is actually <laughs> real. Like, you, I think it was right in front of where you and Dylan Berkey, former Ringer pro- video producer, were sitting where he hit that fade three out of the corner yeah. and I lost it on the opposite end of the court seeing that like my mind was blown seeing a guy his size do that and I felt similarly when he hit that floater three pointer uh, last week playing for Metropolitan's 92 because his overseas season has started playing in the French A League and uh, he's been equally unbelievable each game, showing off all the goods we saw against the Ignite and showing off even more skills. Like, it, it just continues to build more and more and more ever since we saw him over that two-game stretch in October. I mean, that just it just put it, it made it all real to me that even when I see it now, um, it just gives you more confidence of what he can become as a player. Yeah, I, I went to dinner <laughs> after that game with a couple of my buddies that work for a team in the scouting department. And we all just kind of sat there, um, not to do another comparison, but we were just, <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll skip the comparison, but we were just sitting there wide-eyed looking at each other like, what did we just witness? Like, we really couldn't, like, grasp or just, like, calculate what we had seen. And uh, another thing that I think that's important, too, I was talking about overlaps, and I think this is the this is the most critical overlap. I don't know why I didn't say this initially. Is like you start talking about the touch and the feel and the fluidity, How often do you get that and then you get a guy that could be like an elite all defensive like rim protector on the other end? His hands are just, he's a menace. I I saw a play the other day where he contested a shot and flew by the guy that was going to be shooting the three and he just reached back into the play with his hand and blocked the dude. Uh, He just does things that are, and you you brought up a really interesting thing about um, his training uh, that he's going to be training with Holger, the guy that worked with, the guy that worked with Dirk, the guy that KD basically adopted a lot of his training techniques and things like that. Um, He seems like a really audacious scorer. 
and a really competitive guy too. I really love that about when oh, he yeah. came into that game, he was just like, Hey guys, I'm Victor Winbanyama. Welcome to my show. This is my, I'm the captain of this game now. He led his now. team back. Yeah. They were down big in that second half and he led them back. And, and I think the competitiveness, like even though he's lean, he competes in the boards, he boxes out, he's not afraid of contact. And and you're right, Kyle, like him working with Holger, I mean, it, it just goes to show the desire to be great. And everybody I talked to in his circle and out of his circle that week in Vegas is it's the mind that separates him. I think you talk about overlap with some of these all-time great prospects. That's where with LeBron James, you know, you look back at that time, we could never have known that LeBron now at, in his late 30s would still be a great player, still be a force in the NBA. Granted, his team isn't. With the Lakers, granted, the circumstances aren't great for him. But on an individual basis, nobody could have seen this coming. But the maturity level was was there at the time. The people who knew knew about him and the desire to be great. With Victor, there's no question about that. And and I think you look at the, you mentioned his handle and the fluidity, and that's the separating skill for him. You look at the rate of improvement for him as a shooter, as a ball handler, all of it points upward for him that this is going to be somebody that continues trending upwards. And already, through seven games playing for the Mets 92, he's averaging 21.3 points, 8.9 rebounds, 2.8 blocks, 2.7 assists. He's shooting 71% at the rim, 75% from the free throw line, which was much higher than it was before in the low to mid 60s. 33% from mid range, not unbelievable, but not bad considering so much is off the dribble. 33% from three, not bad because if you look at the splits, 42% on catch and shoot threes. 23% on dribble jumper threes. At this age, like, I'm not overly concerned about him shooting, you know, 23% on dribble jumper threes, 33% for mid range, because everything's trending up for him. And the fact he can already create space for some of these shots to give himself an opportunity to score off the dribble, that's the real benefit of him playing for Mets 92. Like, they treat him like a superstar. He has a high usage. They give him the, the freedom to do stuff like this. And He's clearly their best player. They're, they have a plus 21 net rating when he's on the floor. They're 6-1 and this season, and they could continue to win games because of the freedom he has to just continue getting better, continue dominating. I'm blown away, man. Like I, I'm even more impressed since we saw him in Nevada. It's been unbelievable. Well, you got to get on a call, actually. I didn't get to hear it live, but uh, how was that experience? I was curious to ask you. You you got to get on there and kind of (laughs) proselytize the gospel of Wimby on there. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I went on the the NBA app um, with Kevin Dana, who uh, was doing play-by-play. He does play-by-play for the Santa Cruz Warriors, and he did it for the G League Ignite and uh, Mets 92 in Vegas, and then they had him do it for... You know, all of Wemby's games, I believe, on the NBA app, and they had me do a, a color commentary focusing on Wemby for the game last Friday. And that was a hell of a lot of fun, man. I, yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. it. It was a great time, and I'd love to do another one if uh, that opportunity comes. I think, um, you know, next two weeks, I believe, he does not play for Mets 92 because he's going to be joining the French national team roster for their upcoming FIBA qualifying games and against Lithuania on this Friday, on November 11th, and then November 14th against Bosnia and Herzegovina. So he's got some good games coming up um, to, to play for the French team. Um, and then back to Mets 92. Can you pronounce the name of his team? You're saying Mets 92. Can you pronounce the the Bologna? <laughs> Can, do you know the pronunciation on that one? I was practicing that the other day. I, you mean, know I, what just, I'm talking about? I just call them Metropolitan 92. <laughs> <laughs> Mets 92 is the easy American way to do it. I believe it's Bologna Lavalier. Lavalia, my wife knows French better than I do. Oh, but anyway, does, yeah. it's not really important. I mean, got, but <laughs> b- well, by, by the time we have our next show, he has two more games: Lithuania and then Bosnia Herzegovina. And it's interesting the way the the NBA has kind of gotten behind him that they're broadcasting it. I don't, I don't know that we've ever really had something no. like this where the league is officially already promoting this person who is being tapped as like the future of the league. Well, they want people to go to the NBA app. They want people using the app. And I mean, we'll see how that translates in the years to come if they get rid of RSNs or whatever. But, you know, I'm broadcasting Wemby's game in France from my apartment in Los Angeles. <laughs> you and I were both in Henderson, Nevada for Wemby's games against the Ignite and Scoot Henderson. They're having his games 
on the NBA app as well. And Scoot Henderson, let's talk about him. He's widely projected to be the number two pick in the NBA draft. He's a six foot two guard, super explosive, 18 years old. When we saw him in October, his what stood out the most to me was his at room finishing against Wembanyama, some of those contorting his body, absorbing contact, finishing around that eight foot wingspan. And that week, his jumper looked improved. You know, he brought intensity on defense. I interviewed him for about an hour a couple days prior to the games being played, and he talked about his desire this season to prove himself on defense. I'm not just an undersized guard. I, you know, I'm not a liability. I hustle. He says he watches Chris Paul and Drew Holiday. You know, he loves Russell Westbrook. He, you know, he talked about how much he loves Russ's pull-up jumper. I don't. But <laughs> I don't know that I'd be saying that publicly. <laughs> no, uh, I know. That, that, was a big, that was a big turnoff for me. <laughs> it was a big red flag. But uh, he's got an attacking mindset. He's he's a willing distributor, very creative. Um, he's played two G League games since then, Kyle. Um, what have we learned in these two games for Scoot Henderson? I think that you're hitting on something that's important for Scoot's development in general. I think that like that is a place that he could become a plus, 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 plus player. Um, because you're right about all the things about the finishing. I thought I was really impressed with him about like he really varied in the way that he would like use his body to create separation around the rim, getting to the other side of the rim, challenging Vic in like an angular sense. I thought that he was impressive. Not putting the ball super high on the glass. He'd put it high on the glass. He'd lay it directly in, things like that. I loved all that. He shot the ball pretty well. But I think that like the Drew Holiday area is something um, that's going to be big for him because he, Sierra and I yesterday on our pod talked about how like Dennis Smith Jr. has that like cornerback body. And that's something I always bring up with Scoot. Scoot is as athletic as uh, maybe more athletic than Dennis Smith and, and quicker, I would say, and more of a nimble kind of a body. And he could like get a lot stronger. I, I think that he could be a terror on defense in the NBA if if he buys into it. And I think his competitiveness makes me think that he's going to buy into it. I'm with you, man. I, I, I think he's going to continue to compete. I've been impressed with him on defense in those two games for the Ignite. The problem is, is he's just not scoring the ball well. Um, he's shooting inefficiently. He's shooting a lot of Pull up mid range twos early in the clock, contested. You'd like to see him be taking more three pointers. I love Scoot still. I still think he's you know a top prospect in this draft. His playmaking ability. He's a very cerebral player. Um, but the gap has widened even more so between one and two. I'd say uh, the question on my mind for you, Kyle, is is Scoot locked in at number two? I mean, is he clearly the number two guy, or or maybe not so much? Uh, I think we need to be good scientists here and not commit ourselves to him being at number two. I mean, I think Wimby is like a whole other conversation. That, um, I have been kind of um, toiling and thinking and, uh, you know, twiddling my mustache about this for a, a couple months now that like I'm not I'm not locked in on it totally uh, just because I just don't think that that would be smart uh, because there are a lot, a lot of good, talented players in this draft. Um, and the scoring and the shooting, that that is kind of the thing that it's hinging on for me, the inconsistency there. Um, I was kind of noticing that, like, I think that he could, he kind of saunters when he's off the ball sometimes and, like, screens away from the ball. He could, like, he definitely could upgrade his use of, like, change of pace and things like that. Uh, but the dribble pull-up stuff, um, yeah, he he also has like crazy torque off the dribble. I mean, probably the most like start stop torque at his position in the draft. I'm just encouraged that um, he seems ahead of schedule as term in terms of like athletic point guards typically don't have command of their gears the way he does at his age. You don't see him just kind of like you don't see him just like scorched earth, like he, he putting pedal to the metal and going as fast as he can all the way. You know, you remember he how could, like, he John could slow Wall down was? if he yeah. needs to. Yeah, and I think that's pretty critical. That's something that you want guys to learn. So that's encouraging. Uh, but no, I'm not totally locked in on him just because there are some ta talented guys in this top 10, projected kind of top 10 uh, Burgoo. We don't really know how it's going to shake out yet, but there are some guys I like that could potentially move ahead of him for me. All right, let's talk about some of them then, because with Scoot, you know, we, we're going to see him play a bunch. G League Ignite plays a full schedule this year. They get two more games before our next pod, so there'll be more Scoot fodder for us to, you know, talk about next week. Two players that are twins, the Thompson twins. Amen and Asar Thompson playing in the overtime elite again this year, now on the same team. These two kids, Kyle, you know, viral players, elite athletes, quick titch, quick twitch. 
you know, explosive guys. Did I say quick twitch? I thought you said quick tits at first. (laughs) I was like, oh man, we're on fire. Um, Yes, quick twitch. Yes, not uh, the opposite quick sand twitch uh, for slower guys that I made up a few years ago. But anyway. (laughs) I very much like the Thompson twins. They can't shoot though, but are the are either of them players that can contend for that number two spot? Yes, yes. I think I think it's Amen, right? I, he doesn't pronounce it yeah. Amen. I think it's Amen. Uh, I, I absolutely. I mean, th- this is something I kind of want to talk with you throughout the season. Is sort of like conversations that are going to really swing our order in a big way, particularly at the top kind of fault lines is what I always think about. Like if this thing swings this way, um, it's really going to affect my order. Um, the shooting consistency for Amon Thompson, if it, if I get to a place where I feel better about it now, granted, I'm circling back here and saying, again, this is a year long process. You're going to hear like last year when Sharks and I talked about the draft, we would on our pod, you, you heard us in real time, Going back and forth, you know, is Paolo one, is Chet one, is Jabari, you know, this is where I am right now. If I'm seeing sort of the playmaking creativity, something that people, if you don't know anything about Amon Thompson and his brother, um, it's Asar, is that how you pronounce his brother's name? Um, Amon is going to walk into the NBA as like a 99th percentile athlete. He's like in that stratosphere. Would you say he's in the stratosphere of like, I think he's like in the like Zach Levine, Gerald Green territory oh, in yeah. terms of an athlete. I mean, he, you know, whether he's, you know, ground bound, you know, moving side to side, first step, or whether he's going aerial, right? I mean, and going at the rim, like this dude, he explodes. He explodes. He explodes and he floats. His, his brother's more 90th percentile. Right. I would Asar say that's right. He's more 90th, I mean, which is fine. Like he's still an elite athlete, but Amen is, I mean, he's otherworldly. Yeah, I mean he's gonna he's gonna be immediately become one of he's one of the most athletic wing prospects I've ever watched. Honestly, I mean, he might be the he's he's in that like I don't know if I want to like invoke the name of uh, or evoke the name of Vince Carter. That one's maybe a little older for for you, like when he was coming like in the mid nineties, coming into college. Uh, but he's just an otherworldly athletic player. But he has like kind of that bendy, shifty creativity. Uh, more than you would expect from his player type. And I feel like the sort of growth played on his game, he's also, they're both six foot seven. Um, I don't let's see if I had the uh, the wingspans in front of me. But they're, they're just built like NBA. Yeah, six nine wingspan. And OTE just has a good kind of developmental system in place. I think I was a little skeptical of it at first, like whether or not it was going to work. Um, it seemed... Uh, I, I just worried about them getting like the best quality developmental kind of attention and things like that. But I've been really impressed with Amin Thompson. Yeah, I mean, the, the playmaking, the athleticism, the shot creation. I mean, as he continues to mature and improves his shot selection, sometimes he takes some, you know, reckless layup attempts. Um, but the key thing is the jumper. You mentioned fault lines, Kyle. I'm not expecting either of these guys to be quality jump shooters by the end of the season. They've been very poor from the free throw line, very poor from three, poor from mid-range. There's legitimate concern from from my perspective scouting them with what they can be as shooters long-term. They just don't have great touch and they don't have great form. So, I mean, it's it's not just like they need to revise their mechanics. It's that even if they do, they just might not have touch considering they're, like, they don't have, you know, horrible free throw mechanics. They just, you know, still look like borderline hackable players. And so I think with these types of guys, you can you can thrive in the NBA without having like a great jump shot. You can. I mean, we you know Ben Simmons right now does not look good for the Brooklyn Nets, but he still had a great, you know, start to his career with Philly. Bruce Brown right now playing next to Jokic in Denver after success in Brooklyn. He's not much of a jump shooter. He can shoot well on like a low amount of attempts, but he's on a high volume guy. You can be a successful player, you know, playing a role cutting and screening and, you know, attacking empty space and playing with a high IQ like some of those guys do. Tom, the Thompson Twins both can. But if we're talking about them as a number two pick in the draft behind Wemby, I, I personally have to see some progress for them as shooters by the time the end of the OTE season it comes because like right now it's just neither neither of their shots look good both top 10 you know are lottery prospects amen being the better one don't get me wrong um both effective defenders as well like that's another bonus for them but like how important to you do you think the jumper is for these guys and i guess generally uh, uh for all prospects 
I mean, it's it, the shooting is hugely important. I think it, it can sort of like close doors on avenues for entire careers. Um, I, I think it really kind of depends on what your pluses are. If you project as somebody that's going to be like a really, you know, what's going to keep you on the floor, you know, um, is are you going to be somebody that's going to be switchable in a way? Like I think about uh, last season, like Tari Eason wasn't a great shooter, but he was somebody with like really, really uh, immensely impressive physical tools, long arms, broad shoulders, big, could like erase gaps quickly. If you're if you're one of those players, and we can tolerate you, maybe shooting in the you know low thirties on on a low rate of attempts, that's fine. But if you look at like I'm in, and, and like I said, when I say fault line, this is a thing that is not, I'm not committed to, obviously, because I'm just saying if I do see big improvement from him, I don't know that I'm totally out on the touch because he shows me touch in like his passing game that's pretty creative and I'm encouraged by that. Um, but to your point, last season in overtime elite, you know, over 26 games, he shot 26% from three on two attempts per game. So it's like, it's something that he is going to have to see major development. Four, but I, I'm really I'm really impressed by his ability to like toggle between on ball off ball. I really favor wings like that with size. All right, Kyle, let's talk about college basketball. We've talked about international Co- college, G-League, college, OT. Did my like subtle South Shore Massachusetts accent just come out right there? I think I call that out more than any person. Whenever Kevin says an O, oh, like an awe, oh, he goes, oh, college. <laughs> wow. I, just love, I love it. It's it's there. My uh, my Boston accent used to be heavier in my teenage years. I don't know I if it changed that. around around college, but in my young 20s, it just Did you intentionally? A little bit. No, never intentional. But like I, I have somewhere on one of my old computers, an old audio clip of me talking like at 17 years old. And I'm like, wow, wow. I had a heavy Boston accent. Not heavy, not like, you know, people from Southie. Yeah. The 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 one that people impersonate badly all yes, the time. Exactly. Anyway, sorry. Well, sorry I, I call that and don't let you just live. Right, let's not college it. basketball. Yet, okay, Kyle. Okay, yeah. <laughs> just, let's do it. All right. Cool. All right. So we're gonna talk college basketball, the uh widely overlooked, you know, components of the twenty twenty three NBA draft. We are not gonna ignore these kids. There's lots of good college prospects this year. So it's our way of introducing some of the top prospects to watch this season. We're going to draft a five-man lineup of our guys, prospects we like this year. And we're also, you know, just to be clear, we're not going to talk about Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, or Michigan State prospects this week because next week, Kyle, you're going to the Champions Classic in Indianapolis, correct? Yeah, it's right. To, it's near me next week, and I'm going to go. And it's it's going to be in uh, Gamebridge uh, Fieldhouse, formerly Conseco, formerly Banker's Life, one of the best places on earth to see a basketball game. You should go. If you have you ever been to the Champions Classic at that in that building, I have not. No, it's great. I would I would recommend people to check it out. But uh, they're, you know, I know Duke is is a big team to omit here for this exercise. We will, but they have so many interesting prospects on their yeah. team, and, and and Kentucky does too, and Kansas and uh, Michigan State maybe not so much, but um, that's going to be a really <laughs> fun event. So I'm excited about that. But there's plenty of other guys yeah. to fill this out. Yeah, we'll be talking a lot about those prospects on next week's show. This week, for the first pick, Kyle, I want to go to Baylor and take Keontae George, a guard, six foot four freshman, just turned 19 years old on Tuesday. Happy birthday to him. Or Keno He's, George, as you it, said. So, uh, yeah, all which of is my away. text messages. <laughs> Correct him to Keno George. It's Keno absurd. George would be, is a great name. I, would, <laughs> I think that'd be a really, I would love that. Yeah, yeah, give, anyway. give him a TED talk, you know? I mean, he's yeah. uh, he's an impressive player, man. I I, lo- I loved his debut for Baylor. He's got a strong frame, sturdy, looks like a football player. He's got smooth shooting mechanics as well for, you know, a guy with his frame. He shot a high percentage from three in high school, 37% since he turned 17 years old. He grinds on defense. He had a block in the first game for Baylor where he fought over a screen and then he mirrored his man on the drive and then he perfectly timed the leap as the opponent was elevating for their jumper and he just ripped the ball out of their hands as they shot it. I thought it was, you know, it summed up what he could be on defense for me with his toughness and the hard-nosed attitude and and good hand-eye coordination. He's a good passer too. You know, not, not like a high-level, you know, point general type of guy, but he puts good zip on the ball. He's accurate. They ran him through a DHO, and right away he made a great whip pass through a cutter, common NBA action there. And I mean, what you want to see from him over the course of the season is 
he doesn't have the quickest first step and not the most explosion on, around the rim. So how does he finish around the basket? How does he create space for his jumper? You know, he ideally at six foot four, you want him running, you know, some point, you know, but combo guards, Kyle, we've we've seen guys like that have a lot of success in the NBA, considering how much ball sharing there is in the NBA. So even if those skills don't, you know, become elite, uh, I still feel really good about him as a lottery prospect this year. Yeah, I think you hit on something there is that like you can't be compartmentalized in a way where you're not participating in kind of on ball stuff. If you're going to be a perimeter player at all, basically, you need, you're going to have to have the ability to participate in those types of actions. Like, and I, I think that I, I kind of was talking with you about a, I think he has the chance to become, you know, one of the best offensive guards ever to come out of Baylor. Like, I think he legitimately has a chance to do that. Um, I agree. He he does he does have that big frame, six foot four. Yeah, let's see his birth. Yeah, eleven eleven eight. You're right. It is his birthday. Uh, but he is one of the he is one of the <laughs> flickier, like, his like birthday. <laughs> no, I was I was remembering you did say that. I was like, yeah, it is his birthday. Um, <laughs> happy B day keynote. Um, <laughs> Actually, he's born in February. <laughs> Let me fact check you here on this B-Day. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I, I, he do, he has one of the flickier, like, hand, wrists, jump shots uh, <laughs> that I've seen. Like, you see a lot of guys, I was talking about some players, you'll see sort of a, ba- a, a balance in the way that they release the ball. The, the A lot of, like, the way the flight of the ball is affected is, like, through their arm. And you look at him, and, like, when he kind of gets to the top of his motion, his shot is really, really soft. You were talking about like the Tom, he's like on the other side of the spectrum from like uh, Amon Thompson. Like he, he, he has, he, I was texting you. I was like, he kind of gives me some, you know, if you paired him with like a high post, you know, screener, you talked about DHOs. I could see him being lethal in those situations because oh, yeah. he kind of gives me some, he's not as like shifty or like twitchy as like Anthony Simons, but He's that kind of like dribble pull up shooter to me. Like that that that's the class I would the phylum I would put him in. I agree with that. There's some Simons in there, right? Like you can see that type of mold for him. And and also that speaks, you know, to the type of role he could play. Simons thrives next to Dame. He can create for him or he can have shots created for him because he's so active off ball. He's a good shooter and come off of screens for you. And, you know, we'll see what level George ends up reaching as a shooter. But considering his high school success, you know, the the mechanics and the building, you know, the foundation that he has right now to build on, I feel good about where he'll continue to go. Um, and, and I would not be surprised one bit if he ends up like as a you know top four, top five guy in the draft, depending on how that development goes. But also, I think, you know, one one quick aside here, it's also, when we talk top five, top six, or whatever for a prospect, that's also going to be dependent on the draft order, right? Because, like, how many teams need guards? You know, like, how many teams might want Scoot Henderson at number two? Like, it might be, might be a team that doesn't need a guard, that just drafted one. It might be a team that is in desperate need of a guard. Like, if Miami ends up sucking and they're in the lottery... They're going to be looking for somebody to replace Kyle Lowry. If Brooklyn, you know, you know, and they they are swapped their picks and they still get number six or number seven, they might need a, a player instead of Kyrie Irving. San Antonio, they still need to replace Dejounte Murray. So and so on and so forth. You know, there's some guard needy teams, but I think for the most part, this draft is more about you know wing scorer types. Um, who's your pick, Kyle? Yeah, I, th- I was going to say that I, I think that's a good thing that you brought up. If we're talking about like 35,000 feet, what are like the storylines of this draft? I, uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing where it's like, is it wing heavy or is there just such a precedent on wings that we are like putting them there because we know that's important? But there does happen to be just a lot of like wing talent in this in this draft. Um, I think I think that's a really good, good point. Um my next pick is a guy, and this isn't like a, I'm not reaching for anything here because this guy ended up being one of the top rated players in his class. But I've I've been a fan of his for quite some time, and that's uh, a guy who is one among many prospects playing for Ar- the Arkansas Razorbacks this year. Arkansas back back from the dead. They're like yeah. a legitimate power. How about it, Oliver Miller? Stand up, Nolan Richardson. Forty minutes of hell. Um, Nick Smith. It's a boring name, okay? It's not the flashiest name in the world. It's not as cool as Keynote. No, Keynote, uh, no. <laughs> no, it's not as cool as Victor Winbanyama. Scoot. Or Scoot. Scoot yeah. Nick Smith. He is a two-syllable <laughs> name just like me. 
Nick Smith is one of my favorite players in the class. You want to talk about like trepidation about, you know, like Amin Thompson has physical tools that are on another level that could like separate him. Nick Smith has all of those things in spades. He is one of the craftiest mid-range scorers um, that I've that I've scouted since I've been doing this. Um, and I just I just love his creativity as a scorer. He's a competitor. Uh, he's six foot four, hundred and eighty five pounds. Uh, six nine wingspan. Um, he's he's just somebody that I think is going to be able to. You talk about like switching between on ball and off ball. Going to be a dependable spot up shooter. I think. I think he could become like an exceptionally good shooter in the NBA. Um, I'm a big Nick Smith Smith fan. Where are you on him? I like him a lot. I mean, I echo all of that, Kyle. I mean, the scoring ability, the craftiness, all at a high level. Would you say he's a like a Booker esque? prospect can he reach that level of stardom in the nba do you see that path for him i would definitely not rule that out at all i think he's somebody that he is in that class of um i'm trying to look at the guys that i wrote down here he's he's sort of in that like hero you know bradley beal devin booker type of guy who is similar in height similar in build not not a like superb athlete but a good athlete and quick and a good and a guy that I think has like high playmaking upside. I think he's somebody that has um I don't wanna I don't wanna go way too far here, but I think that he has like top thirty player potential, like in the league. I think he's he could be like a really exceptional player. I, I mean, mean top, live top thirty is like that's that's high class. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of great players in the NBA. I feel like, you know, a hot take would have been saying top ten. No, I'm not going there. Yeah, I don't I, believe I mean, that. So I'm top, not going to say it. Top <laughs> 30 is still all-star caliber, all NBA bubble. Like top 30 is is still pretty hot. It's got some heat to it. Yeah, I mean that that was one of the that was the thing when I evaled uh, Jalen Green. I think we maybe have talked about this. I was like, I see him maybe you know getting in that like 20 to 30 range, and people were like, Oh my god, what? I was like, Guys, you know how many fucking good players there are in the league right now? Like. <laughs> There are so many. It's like a tremendous compliment. I know I've said that before, but I mean, like Nick Smith um, is a really talented player and and they have other good players. Jordan Walsh is a six, seven wing Trayvon Brazil, um, six, 10 sophomore forward and Anthony Black. Arkansas is going to be a fun team to watch this year. What's the dynamic going to be, you know, between an Anthony Black and a Nick Smith? Because Black is more of the, the pass first guy, correct? Uh, I would say so. I, I think that. I mean, they got the snot beaten out of them by Texas to, <laughs> to open the season. They lost by 30. And Nick Smith did uh, not play in that one. Right, right. He, he. Uh, I think it's a knee issue, right? He has mm-hmm. knee soreness. Yeah. yeah. Another guy that we're going to talk about is out too. Um, but yeah, I would say that that's a, a fair description of their dynamic. But Arkansas, I don't know. I can't tell if they're going to be one of those freshman teams. And believe me, from personal experience, I've, I've, I've watched a lot of those in a rooting interest way. They can be stressful. I don't know how good they're going to be out of the gate. They might be one of those teams that like peaks kind of later in the year because they have so much youth on the roster. I mean, at the least, it'll be interesting to see how he performs, assuming he gets back and he's healthy, plays the whole year next to two other potential first-round picks. Mention Anthony Black, Jordan Walsh being the other one, uh, more of a forward for their roster. I want to stay in the south here for my next pick. Go to Alabama with Brandon Miller, six foot nine. Great length, fluid, takes long strides on his drives to the rim. Mid-range, you know, heavy, right? Like this guy pulls up from mid-range a lot with step backs, side steps, turnarounds. You want to see him extend his range. Um, like that that's a key thing for him in his first game for Bama this week. His first shot was a missed three-pointer, and then he followed up with an offensive board. And I thought that kind of summed up his night. Needs to extend his range, but he does all those little things. He crashes the boards. He's active. And what I'm really most excited about with him, aside from the scoring, because that's the number one skill, is the playmaking. Because oh, yeah. he made a pass early in the second half of his debut. Pick and roll, middle of the floor, Kyle. We see it all the time in NBA, different defenses. Sometimes they switch, sometimes they drop. In this case, the defense blitzed him. And he calmly backed up his dribble waited for the big man to roll into space, and there was a help defender coming from the corner three shooter to help down on the roller. And as soon as that help defender started to rotate back down to the corner three shooter, Miller fired a sidearm pass above the defense because he's still so tall in a perfect spot where only the big could catch it. And even it didn't result in assists. 
You know, the defense recovered. You know, the, the big man could not score, but he dished it off to another guy who did. So it turned into a hockey assist. But I thought that moment summed up, this isn't, Miller's just not some tall, lanky bucket getter. He plays with his brain. He can create. He can make his teammates better. And I guess my hot take, you know, with Miller this year would be that he has a chance to go top five in the draft with that combination of skills as a scorer, as a creator, and then as a versatile defender as well. I think this guy's for real. Yeah, I've seen that chatter kind of floating around out there. I've seen more more and more people say that. Um, and, and I don't think that that's crazy at all. He actually was on the YBL team with Nick Smith. And I think he posted more assists than Nick Smith did. Um, but when he's on ball, I think if you can get one of, we used to joke last year about like the draft vernacular is always kind of hilarious to track. And like on ball juice is one that you heard. So I'm going to bring it out here. On ball juice with Brandon Miller has been impressive. And I think if you can get a guy who can leverage advantage and all that means all, when we say that all that all we mean is if you draw he- extra help or do you, do you have composure to a make the read and then b make the pass and for somebody you know, he's a little older he's already almost 20 years old and the season is like starting um that's something just to kind of note on or factor into like where you think he could go or how much time he needs to go where he needs to go um he's a really really interesting player people have projected him as potentially the best player in the SEC this year i don't know about that but um, maybe not like now. I think years from now we may look back and be like, damn, Brandon Miller, uh, what a talent. Um, he's at the very least going to be somebody to monitor this year in terms of what you're talking about, his mobility to get like in the top five. It could happen. I mean, and like we've talked about with a number of guys already, you know, improving as a three-point shooter will be one of those key determining factors for him. So, so far we've got two guards, Keontae George, Nick Smith, a forward and Brandon Miller. Who are you filling out this five-man lineup with, Kyle? Who's your next pick? Uh, I'm going to pick a guy who is also out right now. He has a thumb injury, but... Uh, you just, just love the sideline players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's too bad, six, but, you know, who you got? He's a six-foot-six six wing, 200 pounds. Um, Cam Whit- Whitmore, who went oh, to yeah. Villanova. Um, I love him. Whitmore, yeah, he's out with a thumb injury, but he he kind of shot into the conversation in terms of people taking him more seriously as like a top 10 pick, maybe even higher than that, maybe a top five pick, uh, because he played really well at the FIBA Americas U18 this past summer, you know, averaged 18.7 points per game, 6.3 rebounds, and he shot 45.5% from three, which had a lot of people saying, we talk about shooting as a swing skill. If you can stay on the floor and do an ad, and this is guy, this is a guy who's like a physically imposing, terrific athlete. Again, not we on, we on, honestly probably should just disqualify saying like, oh, he's not. I'm in. <laughs> no one is. So we, I'm just going to stop saying that. But he's he's a terrific, terrific athlete. Um, I'm not sure on the timetable for when he's going to be back. Um, but uh, he's somebody I want to watch. Um, yeah, I think his upside is is, is pretty strong. They said he'll be sidelined until at least, you know, next month, last month. So that was early October when they said until at least next month. And as far as I know, we, there's been no reporting on when exactly that'll happen this month, if, if at all. Um, but we'll see. Once he does come back for Villanova, like what a perfect situation for him. With, the, with their system there, the movement they play with, the motion, the style they play, the fundamentals they teach. I think for Whitmore, you know, like you mentioned the athleticism. He's got some feel, you know, he can, you know, he's going to make highlight plays. He like, like for offensive boards, he flies over the defense when he comes <laughs> in, <laughs> like he can just fly in for putbacks Superman, yeah. over, over everybody. It's so fun to watch him. Um, but also true with the jumper. You know, you mentioned how well he shot uh, earlier this year. Since age 16, he's shooting 33% from three, 66% from the free throw line. So I like, this since, I like this since age thing you're doing here. I like this wrinkle that you're adding to his birthday. I just, I just wanted, I just wanted to let you know, man to man. I like, I like that. It's good to have a little background on these guys. College samples are small, aren't they, Kyle? They are, man. And that's like a big, I'd like you, we've talked about this the past few years. It's a thing that people screw up every year because they'll watch a weird college year and be like, "Eh," or, or people will parachute in. And that's the danger of doing this. And, um, you know, teams are taking that more seriously, I think. I think teams are taking, like, that kind of grassroots vetting, not to get into this, but I, I like that touch because I think that that's important information, you know? Because if you have a weird, anomalistic number, you're like, well, this guy can't shoot, and you neglect what has happened before, you might miss, and you might miss a good player. Well, for sure. I mean, especially with a 
you know, a thumb injury. It's on his shooting hand too. Like that could, if he shoots 20% from three this year, it's doesn't mean that he's Isaac Okoro. Uh, like <laughs> I, I just said in passing, maybe he's an Iguodala type. Like, do you kind of see that in his game at all? With the athleticism and the below average shooting, but the feel and the deep, you know, I don't know. Like I, that, that's who comes to mind when I've watched a lot of his high school video. Yeah, I, Kev, there's some comps that I have a hard time just, I have a hard time letting them leave my mouth. Ig- Iguodala is so, so smart and switchable, like on the level of like, Pip, you know, like a Pippin type all time defender. Um, no, I, I think the finals MVP. <laughs> he's yes oh man it was cracking me up last year when we would read you know you you just read comps that people would have in in their in their rankings and it'd be like you know andre iguodala like for somebody that was ranked 25th i was like oh, if he's andre iguodala he should be in the like well, top five as uh, someone who know. has to do comparisons for the nba draft guide like comps do you feel indicted right now did no, i just no, did comps, <laughs> i think i think comps i don't love comps first of all but i think for people who consume them it's about contextualizing the type of player that they are it's it's like when i see them or i use them it's never about that he's going to reach that level of player so well here's kind of the the bucket they fall into he might only be 70% of Iguodala, but it's like that type of mold Right, like okay, sure. here's here's a, a name that you might know, and you understand the style of game that they have, and that gives you an idea of who the player is. Like it's like there's no such thing as a you know an equal comparison. Like every player has like little differences, right? So I think you know what, the thing we do in the NBA draft guide um, that I like is you know Juliet Littman years ago when we first launched it on the Ringer, she's like, well, why don't we do shades of? Because I was pushing back against using the word comparison. She said, how about shades of? So yeah, I think, that's you know, good. Shades of, you know, Andre Godala for Whitmore. I, th- I think that's fair. You know, yeah. he's in that bucket. I think you just kind of have to do, you have to clarify, and this is like a, a comp conversation in general. Comp is one of the most like riddled with like trouble, tr- troublesome combo because it misleads people. I, th- I think you have the right sort of like measured attitude about it like i think that you know iggy would be the highest outcome of this type of player like if he's a connective switchable like he gives you some playmaking can hit open you know the occasional open shot take the tough assignment yeah i mean yeah that that's a valuable player like that doesn't necessarily need him and you know iggy something that's underrated is he brought like point guard skills off the ball oh which yeah. is something that i look you know, in in a non ball ball dominant player, that's something that I really like in players, and I look for to get IQ on the floor. Um, so no, I don't think that's crazy. So we have a roster so far with four guys: Cam Whitmore, Brandon Miller at the wing, Nick Miller, and Keontae George in our backcourt. Kyle, we need a five. This is a segue into a segment that I think that we're going to do. Um, whenever it's appropriate, you know, I don't, and we'll yeah. pull it out willy nilly. Um, and this is to honor our buddy, John Charks, um, who was one of the smartest draft people I've ever known. I mean, John forgot more about basketball than I will ever know. Um, so we're going to call this the Mark of Charks, you know, like they have like the hand of Saruman, like the big white hand. I'm going to like <laughs> put a big TJ on this guy uh, or, yeah, or JT. Sorry. Um, learn to spell Kyle. Yeah. So. This John had preferences on players. Um, we know this. He loves he, small ball. He loves small ball. <laughs> OG Ananobi, the future center of the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> Cock uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, so he loves stuff like that. He loved big physical switchable, like four threes, guys that were like, had the bodies of power forwards, but they were sort of wings, like wing forwards, like Tari Eason I brought up a minute ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, he loved him. He loved Patrick Williams for the Bulls when he was at Florida State. He had Those OG ranked top five or something like that, I believe, that drafts. Like, he loved OG, and he was right about him. I think, I, I mean, the early returns are that he was right about Tari, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, yes. um, he texted me back in, like, October and was like, I have Tari number five. And I was like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> it's just like my head exploded. I was like, what? Uh, but I think he might end up being right about that. But mm-hmm. the guy that I think that, like, that has stood out to me, and I was kind of going through the draft class, and there are a few candidates, um, Jarris Walker um, for, for Houston was. Oh, I love him. One of the better recruits uh, that Houston's ever gotten, I know like Quentin Grimes was a five-star that transferred there. 
Houston's reputation has, and, and you know, Kelvin Sampson has has garnered this, I think, rightfully, is that, like, his team's defend, dude. Did you watch that Arizona-Houston game last year? Like, um, they, they're not afraid of anybody. And I think that if you get Jairus Walker in there, this guy's a six foot eight uh, forward with a seven foot two wingspan. Uh, he's from New Freedom, Pennsylvania. New Freedom sounds like a town from Red Dead Redemption. I just wanted to throw that in there. But he was ranked in like the 10 to 12 range in his class. Um, long arms, plus seven wingspan. He's built like a tank. I think he could bother big ball handlers. Uh, 240 pounds. He's Huge. a big boy. Yeah. A lot of muscle. That's not fat. That's 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 muscle. His shoulders, dude, are <laughs> they're too gargantuan. <laughs> He's a big dude, but he closes on the ball quickly. He kind of seems like a Florida State type player to me, doesn't he? He seems like somebody that would be a Leonard Hamilton. You thinking project. like Scotty Barnes, that type of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or uh, or uh, Raekwon Gray, you know, just oh, those yeah, big yeah. dudes. I don't know where he finds those guys, but. He see, I think John would have would have really liked Jairus, uh, Jairus Walker. We throw around the, oh, he could defend one through five thing a lot. It, I don't think it's unfair to say with Walker, with his fluidity and quickness and size and strength and explosiveness. Like, dude, he had a block in that first game for Houston where, like, he 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 turned his body and looked like like a SpaceX starship just taking off. Like he just exploded, <laughs> dude. Like it's just a little Elon it's, reference it, for you there, right? It's Kev, instant it's predictable, right? An instant. <laughs> He's so fast off the bounce, man. Like I, I don't know. I, I see the room protection, the switchability. Is yes, that fair to I say? do. One through five. Oh yeah, I think so. I you know the one through five thing. You you what people always do there is they assume you meet 100% of the time. And, you know, basketball is like situational. Like, are you, is he going to take tough assignments one through five? Maybe not. But in a, in a one-off situation, can he check a guard for a play if he gets on an island and hold his own? I don't know about his, like, hip fluidity. I'd probably put him more in the, like, two, two through five, but he's heavy in the two, three, four. He could take tough assignments. Um, he's going to be a player to watch. I, I, I think that his offense is going to have to, like, develop and, and like, um, get some polish for him to like stay on the floor. But if he's going to add, like we were talking about, if he's going to add, um, if he's going to add those things on the other end, I think that that's going to uh, keep him on the floor and uh, make him make him an important player potentially at the next level. So he did not shoot the ball well in his debut. You know, three of fourteen. Um, you know, one of the best baskets he had was like cleared out the left side of the floor for him, and he did a little pump fake, and he just plowed right through the defender on his way to the basket and. After the game, Kelvin Sampson, their head coach, was asked about, you know, how he didn't shoot the ball well. And I, I thought his quote was illuminating, you know, about what kind of you're touching on with him. And, and Kelvin Sampson said, I could care less if he shot three or 14. You got to be pretty shallow to judge his night by that. You judge his night by how he bought him to Cougar basketball. And I thought he was awesome tonight. He defended. He rebounded. He was extremely unselfish. And like I think that's the thing with Walker that is important to contextualize. We don't know what the shooting numbers will be this year. Um, you know, he shot pretty well at IMG Academy last year on a very, very tiny sample. He didn't shoot a lot. Uh, most of his shots within 10 feet of the basket, you know, on little pull-ups, you know, closer to the rim, turnarounds from the post, you know, high 60% from the free throw line. I don't think he's a non-shooter. Um but this is like player who it's about everything else. The jumper would be like the cherry on top. Kind of like I, we mentioned Scotty Barnes and passing earlier. I mean, like, is that is that a fair path for him? You know, like when we're talking about what he can be as a prospect, does he have that playmaking ability in him? You think? I don't. Scotty's pretty special in terms yeah. of his his ability on that front. I I don't think that he's in that stratosphere. Not even a Draymond level as a playmaker. You know, Scotty's more of the the pure point. Draymond probably a tick below that as a passer. You'd I mean, be you'd be inferring a lot about things we haven't seen, and I think that's something about Draymond that's always really difficult to project. Is that Draymond had this realization, you know, after he got into the NBA and realized that he was going to have to adapt and evolve, uh, which is the theme of a, a series. Sirit and I are talking about right now is that just self awareness. That's a special thing too, and and pretty pretty rare in like the history of basketball. Not to go into that, but I think that he playmaking upside. I don't see it as much. Um, I wouldn't put him in that category unless he surprises me um, and, and and shows more this year on that front. Um, but like we said, this is a, a living document, an ongoing, evolving discussion. He might. He might show us something on that front. But 
that would be that would be pretty remarkable, Kev, if he did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got a long way to go, but I, I do think with him, you know, we put him as our as our five in our lineup here, um, in honor of our amazing friend Jonathan Charks, who, like you said, Kyle was. I I always love talking draft with Charks, whether we agreed or disagreed on prospects. I remember back in the early days of the Ringer when Danny Chow was with us, and we did our you know draft boards and co-wrote articles, arguing you know back and forth about players: Tatum, Josh Jackson, OG at the five. You know what's OG going to be? Is he a top five guy even after the torn ACL? And I don't know. I I, I miss Charks, man. I miss talking draft with him. And I think this year, um, this class features. Like we talk about Walker here, there's a lot of prospects, man, that kind of fit that profile. Yeah, in this class. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be weird. Now, I, I, to not, I mean, I'm just being transparent. It's a weird thing to move on. Um, you know, you you don't want to feel like you're moving on too quickly. You know, it did it did feel weird to just be like, hey, let's just charge into another year and not acknowledge John. I, and I, I mean. John would have been really excited to be at that that Wimby thing that we went to. I thought about him. I think about, I go to text him like every day. I have the thought process like, man, I'm, I wish I could ask John about that. Um, and I'll just say this, like on this show, I mean, I, I just want us to talk about him consistently and use his Charxian sort of like, you know, like the things that, that we learn from him, I think are fun to incorporate and just to keep him alive or to keep his memory just kind of in the air. And I, I don't, I don't know. That's something that I want to do. I know we're being heartfelt all of a sudden here and, and saying something really serious, but I'm, uh, I'm not a guarded person about like how I feel or what I'm thinking about. You know, I think that it's healthy for us to 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 say that we miss him. And, you know, I I, I think that the like the, the mark of Charks is a way to a fun way to do that. And I, I'm always going to be open to like what would Charks have said about this because uh, I miss him. Yeah, he was he was a good friend. So absolutely. I'm very glad we got to see Charks in Vegas earlier this year at Summer League. That, yeah. that was special seeing him there. That was a that was a great week. Um yeah, I mean, it just, it just felt like a, a triumph. I talked to Chris Vernon about this, you know, on the mismatch, uh, but it was it was the coolest thing. The memory, him and I both had a similar one, but, but uh, Verno was sitting at the top of the stands in that side arena, <laughs> and Charles Char was like, where are you sitting? You know, and Verno was like at the top, and he walked up there, and, and then I walk in to go see Charles later, in, like the next day or something like that. I'm like looking around everywhere for him, and he's like, look up, and he's like, <laughs> like the back row. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, despite his situation and how he was feeling, like he, he still was, you know, climbing up to the top. He was still doing everything he could that made him happy. Um, yeah, he had a beautifully yeah, defi awesome. defiant attitude about his yeah. situation. He was like, "Nah, I'm not." He's yeah. just like, I'm, "I refuse to, I refuse to to stop or to to take it easy." You know, but we had so, a great conversation with them that week too. The, the pod oh, we recorded that was a lot of fun. Yes, yes, I was uh, completely hungover in that video, as I've said. But uh, <laughs> yes, that was an incredible, <laughs> it's, it's incredible, <laughs> incredible conversation, and. Uh, yeah, I, I think we, you know, let's let's just seize every every chance we can to remember him. Absolutely. You know, it's a dialogue. I'd love to hear from people uh, on that front too. No doubt. And I, you say it's a dialogue. I think for listeners of this program, we also want people to tweet at us, you know, or message us on Instagram, wherever, um, with their thoughts on the draft, prospects that we should be watching, prospects that we should talk about, questions that they have, whatever it might be on your mind, because there's a lot of college basketball teams. A lot of prospects to watch. And sometimes, Kyle, we're going to be going on the road to talk about them. We already mentioned earlier, you're going to go to the Champions Classic next week. I'm hoping to make some trips, uh, fly into Vegas and watch some G League Ignite games over the course of the season. I'm sure we'll meet up somewhere during the tournament in March and you know, plenty of other premier games that we'll be doing some podcasts around. I'm looking forward to this with you, man. Like This was a fun first episode and... Uh, I think I think I think this year this draft class has a chance to be one of those special ones to follow with Wemby up top and some of the interesting characters that we've already talked about. I think you know th we mentioned it in passing earlier. This is a wing heavy class. There's a lot of wings currently likely to go in the first round. Not a lot of you know bigs. We'll talk about some of them. Ware out of Oregon, you know, a Kentucky, you know, a, a Duke player lively next week. Yeah, Derek Lively. Yeah, there's there's a, a number of wings this year that I think are are tailor made for the NBA to come right in next year and make a difference and potentially grow to be more than just a role player. Oh yeah, there's a there's a lot of talent to discuss and I, it's going to be fun to. I I just enjoy the sort of like correction and like the uh, like we we're like ah oh, we were you know 
maybe this guy is actually somebody will like emerge inevitably. That always kind of happens. People get too high on something. Just the, the dialogue. It's just it, it's fun. So, yeah, looking forward to looking forward to doing it. Well, thank you for listening to this first episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. Please do us a favor. Subscribe wherever you're listening to the show. Pass the link along to your friends if you think they might like it. Uh, really would help the show out with this new podcast feed here. If you want to hear Kyle Mann with Sirius So He every single week, head over to the Ringer NBA show. They're currently doing a series on, what is it, Kyle? Adaptation, evolution, and surviving in the NBA. First one was about Dennis Smith Jr. and how he's kind of adapted to find a role in the NBA. And I'm on the Mismatch podcast feed with Chris Vernon every Tuesday and Friday. This feed will be about the NBA draft. That's why it's called the Ringers NBA Draft Show. Kyle, I'm fired up to be doing this all year with you, man. Have a good day. You too, buddy. 